I'm Lauren Lestowskis. I'm the program director at Grit Health, and I'm a cervical cancer survivor. Um, a lot of you know me from our other programming and meetups. And we really wanted to have a program to acknowledge what May is. May is actually Mental Health Awareness Month, and mental health is a big topic that always, always, always comes up on um, our member meetups. Um, something I am very aware of and have dealt with through life, even before diagnosis, during diagnosis, and now after. Now I'm five years out and still deal with some mental health, uh, you know, issues, if we want to call them that. And so I think it's a topic that's super prominent in the cancer world and something we're always chatting about at Grit Health. So I wanted to bring you guys the best of the best for resources. Um, and hopefully tonight, our guest speaker from our nonprofit partner, Cancer Care, will be able to help you feel a little bit validated in your feelings, go over some tools um, to add to your toolbox of how to deal with things. And so tonight is um, a complete safe space. We are recording the program. Um, so if you feel like you want to or need to, you can turn your camera off, change your name so your name is not showing up. But in about a week, two weeks tops, we will have this recorded session back on our website. And we will also have a summary blog of what was discussed tonight. And I will email everyone who registered so you guys will be aware when it's back up online. And um, like I said, this is a safe space. Uh, the chat will be kept all between us. I don't do anything with the chat. So if you have questions throughout, throw them in the chat, feelings, thoughts, Anything goes uh, at Grit Health. I and our team are always here to be with you and meet you where you are, whether you're having the worst day or the best day. Uh, we're here for everything in between. So, and tonight we will kind of touch on some things that might be a little sensitive, emotional. Um, so I just wanted to say that as well. And so all of this is informational for you um, when it comes to your healthcare um, choices and decisions. We always urge you to make those choices with your medical team um, and uh, get the help you need if you need it. And hopefully you'll learn um, a little bit about getting help tonight as well. So um, thank you again. And I will stop talking and I will hand it over to our speaker, Charlotte from Cancer Care. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm Charlotte. I'm a social worker at Cancer Care. I am so excited to be here tonight. Um, I know that a lot of you are joining us from all over the U.S. and outside of the U.S., and I am really excited to be here, mostly because, I was telling Lauren earlier, this is my whole job, is to talk about cancer and mental health, and mostly because it's a huge part of the cancer diagnosis that at least initially goes kind of untouched, which is important, right? Your doctors have to talk about cancer. They have to talk about what it does to your body. Thank goodness someone is paying attention to that. It's not me as a social worker. It's definitely someone on the more medical end. But because we're going to talk about the mental health side of things and because we're going to dive into that, I want to start tonight and just do a quick grounding exercise. And I know that you guys don't know me, and I know that I don't know you yet, but we're about to spend a whole hour together. So I'm going to ask for a moment for us to just gather here together. If you want to shut your cameras off for a minute so that you feel comfortable, take a deep breath. We're going to sit here together. We're just going to do a quick body scan. We're going to put our feet on the floor if you're sitting. If you're laying down, that's fine too. Make sure you're feeling comfortable. If you feel comfortable closing your eyes, you can. If that makes you feel like really exposed or vulnerable, that's okay too. Just lower your gaze a little bit, maybe towards the bottom of your screen or towards your keyboard. Take a breath and put your hands on your knees, on your legs. Roll your shoulders back and breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth and feel where your feet are on the floor. Take a deep breath in, send them to your feet. Just send one bit of gratitude towards your feet today. They've done such a great job. They've really got you where you've needed to go. Another breath and relax your legs. They've done a great job today too. 
doing what they've needed to do, whether that's resting, whether that's, you know, any side effects, any symptoms from your treatment, from your diagnosis, whether that's walking, whether that's sitting. Thank goodness for them today. <sighs> On your next breath, I just want you to send some gratitude towards your hips, towards your waist. Check in, see if there's any tension in your back. And send a moment, just a quick check-in, see how your shoulders are doing. So often we hold tension there. So take a minute, take an extra breath there and breathe in and out. And if it makes a lot of noise, you guys are muted, that's fine. You can breathe out really noisily, we won't know. And breathe in and out, wiggle your fingers a little bit, see how they're feeling. Do your hands need a moment of kindness? Take an extra breath here. How does your face feel? Has it been holding any stress today? Your eyebrows, your ears, your mouth. And before we launch into today's program, I just want to give you a heads up that we're going to talk about some heavy things. But if at any point you feel like you need to go off camera or you need to take a minute for you, this whole time here is for you. So that's OK. No one here is going to get offended. No one here is going to, you know, have anything to say other than we're really glad you're here today. Then we're really happy to have you here. So in this moment, wiggle your toes, wiggle your hands. Take another deep breath all the way down to your belly and blow it out. <sighs> Sorry for that static on your end because I am not muted. And let's come together. Thank goodness we are here to come together. I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show you my slides. And we're going to chat. So I'm going to start from point of initial diagnosis. I'm going to run through kind of beginning treatment, scans and recurrence. We'll talk a little bit about metastatic cancer as we go through. We're gonna talk a little bit about like common stress factors and coping strategies as well. If at any point you've got questions, absolutely talk in the chat. I cannot look at the screen and my slides and the chat, so I'm not even gonna try. Lauren's got an eye on that. You guys have a good community, so just do you. And I am gonna chat the whole way through on my own and then we'll stop for questions as we go. So I'm gonna dive in. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. So there's a lot of times when having that first word, you have cancer. There's a cancer diagnosis can feel like that's where things begin. Realistically, that's not when people's cancer story begins. There's a whole pre-diagnostic period when statistics and when like my experience working with people have shown that a lot of times the most and the highest point of anxiety and stress level comes oftentimes before people are even diagnosed, that first onset of symptoms or that first batch of like, how many doctors did you have to go to to get a diagnosis? So that pre-diagnostic period and that diagnostic period leading up to when do you hear the words you have cancer? And what do those words mean to you? What sort of narrative does that evoke for you? So sometimes this brings up, what's this word cancer bring up in your life? What's your relationship with cancer bring up for you? And that can be a real stressor for people. We have an assumption in different cultures and different communities of what cancer means. And that can be a hard thing to work through when you're also suddenly learning like what your diagnosis is, what your treatment is, what the expectations are, who your medical team is. All of this information that you have to process and take in is a lot of uncertainty. <laughs> And this uncertainty that you're trying to figure out hey, well, we've got some socks down here that need to go upstairs. It's hard to hard to figure out as you go. Uh -huh. So 
one of the things that I recommend the most when we're uncertain about things or when people aren't sure like what's coming up when there's a lot of anxiety is starting with keeping a notebook of appointment dates and scan dates of what they know is happening now. What can you ground yourself in of what's happening right now? We don't know what's coming up. We don't know what's happening in the future. What's happening this week? What appointments have you had? So that when you go to that next appointment of who knows what, of what treatment might come, what doctor might be there, whose names do you have to remember? You can say, you know, on May 1st, I saw Dr. X, they told me this information. On May 2nd, I saw Dr. Y, they told me this. And you don't have to remember what their faces look like. You don't have to remember any of that quite yet. But at least you can feel a little bit grounded in that moment because taking on all of that uncertainty is really a lot to navigate in that initial time period. So the second thing that I recommend often when people are first hearing that news is to start looking into what online support communities look like. You don't have to join any. You don't have to you know, start talking to other people. That can feel overwhelming. But to know that communities exist, to know that there are other people who are out there with a similar diagnosis. And again, I'm not saying that you have to like join a group. That can absolutely happen at a later date. But there's a moment in an initial diagnosis sometimes where people feel that they're the only one in the room, right? Where they feel like a number or they feel like doctors are paying attention to the cancer and not paying attention to them as a person. And that's really hard to navigate when you know who you are as a person and you've got to go home to your kids or your partner or your job or the whole rest of your life and figure out like, where do you go from here? How do you build the rest of your life into that? So I do often suggest like starting Yes, you'll get to the medical side of things too, but knowing that there's support out there right from the get-go, even if you don't sign up for it for four months, five months, a whole year out there, knowing that there is a community like Grid Health, like Cancer Care, other online support communities as well, at least so that you know you're not alone. The other thing that can sometimes be helpful as an initial coping strategy is just to do a quick mood tracker. And this might be, especially as people have like their phones more and more attached to them, might be something like a in a note app. It might be an app on your phone that specifically tracks your mood so that you can pay attention to are your stress levels increasing? Are your like symptoms of anxiety, symptoms of depression, symptoms of like not sleeping, fatigue, worry? Is any of that changing? for two reasons. One, because your mental health matters. And two, because you are seeing a whole lot of doctors all at once, all paying attention to your cancer. And like I said before, like we, we want that. We want the doctors to pay attention to that. But we also want them to know who you are as a person, including the cancer diagnosis. So if you are not sleeping, like we want for your medical team to know that, to know that that's happening from the get-go, and to see if there's support at your treatment center, aside from online support communities, aside from like nonprofits and other organizations, we want to know like, is there another support out there, someone at your treatment center, a social worker, a nurse navigator, a therapist, a psychiatrist, someone right there who can know you, who can work in tandem with your medical team. So that's some of the initial coping strategies. We'll get to the you know other, other programs as well. But then once you begin treatment too, we look at some of the the stress factors there, right? So we've got the initial diagnosis. What does beginning treatment look like then? It's changed a lot with COVID. So if this is something that some of you might be more newly diagnosed in the past year or so, some of those feelings of isolation or or loneliness that maybe two years ago I would have said, can we bring someone? Can your caregiver be there with you? Can someone come with you to chemo or to a radiation appointment? Can you have someone in the room with you? A lot of that shifted with a COVID-19 crisis in treatment centers. So we're looking more at, you know, can we have can we have someone be on speakerphone? Can you FaceTime someone in when traditional avenues of support might not be accessible currently? But one of the difficulties here is that when your treatment begins, it's also the same time that your medical team is beginning to be formed, that you're starting brand new relationships with people who are really important. You're starting to be given hugely important information. 
And there's often a lot of times when your your body and your brain are in shock. Now, from a scientific perspective here, you can absolutely be in crisis. Now, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're, you know, really using like an analytical mind to cope with this, and that can be really helpful. There are other times when your body really might not be taking in information in this initial like treatment phase. That's okay. It's really normal to say, you know, it was just a fog. I did what I had to do. I showed up to the appointments and that is all I could do. And that's absolutely normal. So if your experience in treatment is that you like showed up and you did it and then you came out the other end, I am here to tell you that that is really, really normal. If you showed up and you processed and you, you know, talk to people along the way, that's also really normal. There's a lot of ways that people cope with this. One thing that I suggest most often is to make a list of questions that you're going to ask the medical team. And I don't always say, like, make sure you understand their answers. What I say most commonly is, like, can you get someone to write down the the answers so that at a later date you can understand it? You might not get it in the room. That's okay. We're not going to understand everything when people are in shock, when you're going through a trauma. If that's something that's traumatic to you, sometimes it can be helpful to call a diagnosis-specific organization to see if there are already lists of questions that exist, to see if those questions are already answered, if there are pamphlets or flyers that someone's already asked that experts have already answered. So a lot of times, you know, right now with the age of the internet, with a lot of those questions out there, it can be really helpful to see If that's been done already, it can also, with Google and with the internet, be really hard to go through that wormhole of, like, where are you getting your information from? So I do always like to steer folks towards, like, going to their medical team and saying, does an organization exist that I can get these questions answered from if it's not you? Um, But we'll take a minute now to see if folks have any questions for me or, Lauren, if you want to steer some my way. Yeah, um, really great information. I see um, someone wrote in here, she was lucky that her medical team, her oncologist and radiation oncologist, uh, those appointments were actually recorded and given to her on, uh, you know, a flash drive so she could listen back. That's absolutely incredible. Um, I did, you know, looking through this, I kind of came up with a question. Um, I know for me personally, being five years out, I wish I would have said, I'm not sleeping, or I'm really irritable, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. Um, Looking back, I'm like, man, I should have said that right from the start and got all of these feelings and emotions and problems under control. So I kind of wonder, um, is there any advice you have on kind of speaking up sooner rather than later? Um, and how to get that support and ask those questions to your medical team. I think, I don't know if this is like a helpful answer here, but I'll just be really straight up with all you guys. I think that most of the time, and this is why I say like, this is a scientific thing. You can't always make the body react as if, like, as if we want it to, right? It's, it's kind of like saying, you know, I, I wish I could have known everything when I was a child and then I wouldn't have like put my hand on the stove. I wish I could have known how to drive when I was, you know, 15. And then I wouldn't have had to like take driver's ed. Like I could have done all these things if I had known differently. But when you don't know that thing or when you've not experienced that trauma or when you've not experienced what depression or anxiety about cancer specifically looks like, you can't even identify it. And so that's part of why that mood tracker can be really helpful to see like, oh, turns out I haven't slept in three weeks. So maybe irritability is coming from that. And to know that you would need to do a mood tracker when you're starting treatment for cancer is like near impossible because you're being overwhelmed with this information. One thing that I say most often, and I tell like every client that I work with, and I say like, I'm going to tell this to you again and again, you're going to hear me say it. It's like a trope. I'm going to tell it to you probably five or six more times is that you're starting like three full-time jobs, right? You're starting your job as someone who's diagnosed with cancer. So you have this identity thrust upon you that you didn't ask for and you didn't really want, and you're not trying to do. You've started a full-time job now of like 
going to med school where you have to learn all this language that you weren't trying to learn and you have to decipher it, whether that's online or through an amazing med like team that records everything and explains. That's amazing. I love to hear that. But you still have to understand it at a later date, even if they're recording it. And then you have to understand like who you are with these new identities that are different than who you were before. And so given all of that, like, are your, are your moods going to change? Are your emotions going to change? Yeah. So could you have processed things differently? Had you gotten emotional support, like when you were first diagnosed, would it have been different? Yes. Would it have been better or would you have not been anxious or would you have, you know, used all of your coping strategies then in a different way than you did post-treatment? Like, different for sure. Would you have had no like stress about it or concerns like realistically? No, it's a stressful time. And I tell people this a lot like this is you know one of the definitions of trauma is like a normal reaction to an abnormal situation and what you do after that, right? Like that matters. It counts that you've you've coped with it. You guys all have really great coping skills. You're here. Like you did it amazing. You coped. Like that, That's all it takes. I know that you have coping skills because you're here coping. So how do we cope in a different way? How do we show up for ourselves in a different way? That's the part that is, you know, sometimes we can tweak them, we can fine tune them a little bit. But I don't know if that like really answered the question, because I think usually the answer is like, no, <laughs> I don't think we can go back and do things differently in a better way. I think it just matters, you know, that you showed up for yourself when you did and that really counts. Yeah, that's that's a great point of, you know, acknowledging that even if I didn't do it before, I'm doing it now. I'm here in this program or I tell somebody how I'm feeling one day. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and everyone can go ahead and keep continuing posting questions in the chat. Um, we'll pause again. But Charlotte, I will let you jump back into covering material. Okay. So we'll go through kind of this scan and result anxiety here. I know a lot of times in when folks are in treatment, it's shortened into like scanxiety because it's a a cute way to frame it, even though it's really not like a cute feeling. I do like that we can make it into one word. But a lot of times once you've begun treatment, there's ways that, you know, we can measure whether that's treat, whether that treatment is working, whether or not that's true for all like for all types of cancer. I acknowledge that there are certain types of cancers that you can't measure whether or not treatment is working until the end of treatment or until set surgeries, absolutely. Part of in this digital world that people struggle with a lot is, you know, sometimes those results come back on their phone or on a digital app before that can be discussed with their medical team. That can be really hard. So one of the things that I recommend, you know, most often is, talking to your medical team about that, saying, you know, I can see these results on my phone before you call me. How can we talk through what that looks like? Can I take this app off my phone? Can you call me first? Can I call you? Can I email you? Is there going to be someone to answer to talk through? Because I can't go three days figuring out what a test result means. Like, like I said before, like you're not going through med school. It is really hard to navigate what a blood test means there are certain times when you can tell, like, is it elevated or lower? Does an MRI show something there or not? But what you do with that is hard to, hard to figure out. So some coping strategies that folks can work through on their own or in partnership with a mental health counselor might be a CBT style thought record to interrupt unhelpful thought patterns. Those are specific to like on all or nothing thinking, catastrophizing different thought patterns that might that you might be able to kind of talk yourself through. Some of these are accessible as like books. You can also talk to a professional about this, Um, but these are like a set of columns that you can ask yourself different questions, different strategies to say, you know, this is the worst result that my head went to when I looked at this scan result. What's realistic? What's another option? What's a little bit more helpful way to think about this scan result? Once we look at, you know, when treatment has 
completed or when you have scan results back, there's there's a couple options. So we will certainly talk about recurrence and metastatic cancer as well. I'm going to start with post-treatment, then there's another break for questions, and then I do want to acknowledge that we'll get to recurrence and metastatic cancer too. So if folks do become post-treatment, some of the common stressors that come up here are returning to the workplace. In COVID, those return to work policies, fears of recurrence, possible immunocompromised status, especially in this pandemic time, and unmet needs after connection with the medical treatment or the medical team ends or after you're not able to connect with the treatment center anymore. Some more formal coping strategies might be joining support groups, counseling for folks who are post-treatment. I like journaling, especially for folks who are post-treatment as a way to process, like what just happened? This huge roller coaster of emotions that folks went on, how to kind of unwind all of that really wound up emotions that as a short-term coping strategy, you can absolutely go straight ahead, put your head down, get through treatment, you know, go right on through as a long-term coping strategy, how do you reflect back on and make sense of that? Journaling might be a way you can do that individually and privately. It is also a way through like online blogs that some people choose to do that publicly. So that's an option as well. Um, and then we do have another break for questions before we go to the recurrence and metastatic section as well. But I can't see the chat, so. I'll open it back up to Lauren. I'll try to be less wordy with my answer too. <laughs> no, no, it's great. I love hearing it. Um, yeah, so I saw somebody in here. Um, I know for me and others, um, like Lori wrote in the chat, um, realizing that this portion after treatment ends and you're kind of, you know, recovering and your appointments get spaced out, that that is almost the more difficult thing to deal with. Um, and really trying to have your, you know, doctor or those do healthcare members that you do still see really try and tell them the importance that, Hey, this is me asking for help. Like I need help. I need support. Like my mental health is not good. So, you know, besides, you know, the support groups, counseling, journaling, um, anything else, that people could look into or ways to kind of broach that subject with their healthcare team? I think it's tricky, especially when people are seeing oncology specialists, right? A lot of people who, a lot of people whose insurance or whose like medical care is based in the oncology realm. A lot of those mental health supports are going to be specified to folks who are in treatment for a cancer diagnosis, which doesn't negate the fact that there's a huge amount of need out there for people who are post-treatment. It's why cancer care has post-treatment support. It's why Grit Health like has people who are, you know, experiencing a need for support. It's why there's like multiple <laughs> points on this bullet on this slide for like unmet needs after connection, because I, I know this, it comes up so, so frequently. So what that looks like, unfortunately, right now, at least in the U.S., is advocating for yourself with your medical team to say, like, so where do I go from here? Is this going to be like a formal support system? Is this going to be through a local therapist, through someone outside of the treatment center? There are some treatment facilities that have post-treatment like programs that have specialized post-treatment care, even that can be sometimes limiting. I do see a lot of benefit from organizations that have like diagnosis specific. And there's a slide on this later when it comes, mm, I think it's on the metastatic slide, but there there is a lot of benefit in the diagnostic specific online communities between like peer matching sometimes can be a good resource because there are mentors who are a few years out. That can be a, a community that might give at least a little bit of advice in terms of like, okay, where do we go from here? That's why I like support groups for post-treatment because someone can say like, yes, those three months, those six months, those you know 12 month windows can be really challenging. It's also where I see a lot of benefit in you know switching to a little bit more like individual or that peer support and saying like, here I am, like, let's redefine that sense of self, right? Or what those, what that grief of loss of self or recognition of like a new sense of self looks like. 
And that can be really beneficial to see, not that there's a silver lining, not that there's like a new exciting opportunity here, but that there is a new version to get to know. The new normal phrase gets thrown around a lot with COVID. It gets thrown around a lot with survivorship. But like, who are you post-treatment? Like, what does that mean? What on earth just happened? And to try to figure out like, okay, so what happens now? Because it, it, there can be good things that come up. So I, yeah, I think, I think usually I would refer to like peer matching or diagnosis specific for, for post-treatment or, you know, nonprofits in the area, but it's complicated. Yeah, that's, that's great information to, you know, you hear it a lot. You've already, I think, said it a handful of times is advocate for yourself, you know, just speak up, tell the check-in lady, the checkout lady, the nurse, the medical assistant, the doctor, like tell everyone, like throw out that, you know, help me. Um, and then, like you said, the nonprofit organizations that work in the advocacy space, um, you know, unfortunately they have to pick up a lot of these pieces, but then again, fortunately, these organizations are there and they are present to fill those needs and help you get the help you need. So Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you touched on that, but thank you. Yeah. I think there's a benefit too. And I say this a lot, you know, when I talk to clients is there's a lot of pressure in, in society to answer that question of like, hi, you know, I'm Charlotte. How are you? There's a lot of pressure to say like, I'm fine. Thank you. And how are you? Right? Like that's a standard answer in like, English class when people are learning what's the response to how are you like people learn I'm fine thank you and how are you as an answer which is well and good but like if you're not fine it is okay to say you know what I'm not doing well today thank you so much for asking I really appreciate that and if that's not where you're at if you are talking to someone that you don't want to tell them that you're not doing fine you can say things are really complicated right now thank you for asking me that I appreciate that too even if you're not saying, you know, like, today, I'm really anxious, I feel terrible. Thank you. <laughs> like, you don't have to share that if you don't want to. But you also don't have to say that you're fine if you are absolutely not feeling fine, and you really want to talk to someone. So I think there's there's absolutely benefit in telling as many people as you want to that you're not doing yeah. well. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to give yourself permission to say how you're feeling and not just give the norm, I'm fine, how are you, or I'm good, thanks, how are you? Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that is actually a way I judge how I am coping and dealing with things on how many people do I say, oh, I'm fine, I'm great, how are you, versus like really get into the nitty gritty. So um, giving ourselves permission to do so, I think is so important, so. Um, Thank you again, and I will let you go ahead and move forward. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to go into the recurrent side of things. So I know that we talked about, you know, when your scans and results come back, what that feels like for you to look at those results on your own sometimes, what that feels like for you to look at those results with a medical team if the results come back and things are post-treatment and you you don't need cancer treatment anymore that can be fine. A lot of that like worry about recurrence then can sometimes weigh on folks. So we talked just now, Lauren and I, about like what it can be like to wait for those scans, wait for those results in that post-treatment realm. If cancer recurs, it can affect people's mental health absolutely in a lot of different ways. And so some of the ways that comes up is stress around like repeating treatments. And sometimes the way that shows up, we'll talk about this too for metastatic cancer, is that there's a lot of language in the cancer world about like beating cancer or winning or this like battle metaphor, which can sometimes feel really supportive to people. So if that's a way that you identify with your cancer, I absolutely don't want to take that away from you. But if that feels like something that is increasing your stress, if it's a cancer recurrence and you're feeling you know, that if you beat it before, that right now that it's a loss or that you've lost or that there's guilt or shame, I want to give you permission in this moment or in the future because we just met that that's okay to let that narrative go. That we didn't pick that narrative. That is society and this world kind of emerged around you, but we didn't sit here today and say, like, this is the best metaphor around us to, to decide. So let's all go with it. That 
narrative of cancer is really weighty. It shows up on the television. It shows up in your books. It shows up in commercials. It shows up on the radio. It shows up all around you that there's cancer as something that's going to be beat or something that's out there to be won. And if cancer comes back, it implies that there's some level of control or that there's some level that you have to fight and now suddenly, what I said before, of like now you have all these full-time jobs and you're a med student and you've got to go to work and learn all these new terms. Like now you're also like a warrior and someone who has to go to war, but you're also working all these full-time jobs and you're going to med school and you're learning all these new things. And now you have to do all those things again and deal with the fact that the first time around, all of those things didn't work because this myth that we are in control of our health is really just that, it's a myth. And that's hard on our mental health because as people and as humans, we like to think that we're in control because it makes sense and we're people. And it is so easy to think that, you know, if we're in control of things, then we can make sense of them and we can take care of ourselves and we can take care of the people we love because that is so much easier than the contrary to think that, you know, nothing is in our control and we just have to really like hope for the best and do what we can. That's really scary. And our bodies don't like to be scared. Our bodies like to live at homeostasis. They like to, you know, be calm. They like to be grounded, which is why we started with a grounding exercise. So if we're used to being like avoiding the scary stuff, we're certainly not going to try to lean into the scary thing of saying, Cancer is outside of your control most of the time. And most of the time, the things that you do that you can control are show up at the doctor's office when you can afford it, when your insurance covers it, when you can pay for gas, when your doctors are in network, when you have the privilege of living in a country that has health insurance that you can like see a doctor. So all of these things converge especially around reoccurrence they're absolutely true in other areas of cancer as well and i say this i didn't say this to here because they're not true in other areas but especially around recurrence when it happens again it is especially vulnerable for people who are feeling like they did all this already and now we're back there at stage one so when we talk about anxiety the first time around or uncertainty upon initial diagnosis and it's why i use that word initial but when we talk about feeling uncertain, there is a sense of certainty when there's a cancer occurrence of people saying, I know what this is like, and I don't like this. There's a certain set of skills that comes with that of saying like, well, I know what this is like, and I know how to cope, and I know these side effects. Absolutely. But there is a level there of hey, hardship, and there is a level there of loss and of grief that comes with that, that is different than stress and uncertainty. So I wanna bear like absolute gentleness when we talk about this. Statistically, and why I mentioned like the financial toxicity part of this here, economic stability tends to play a little bit of more of a role in mental health around recurrence rates than medical status or like stage of um, stage of recurrence when it comes to cancer recurrence. And this is, based on studies that isn't to say that recurrence isn't stressful in terms of like a diagnostic stage, but just to say that also financial to toxicity is especially hard recurrence wise. And some of this is to do because cancer is like financially toxic from the get go. So my guess is that part of this is that if it happens again, like people are even more hard, um, stressed out with the financial burden of things. So some of the coping strategies here really are going to be more on the individual level. And I, I say this because the more formal types have already been used. So you can absolutely still access those, right? Like there are still support groups, there are still organizations, there are still counseling, there's all these things still exist, but people already have access to them and have primarily already been told about them. So planning small acts of kindness towards the self. One thing that I tell people often is like, can you treat yourself like you would a child? 
we are really kind to children, hopefully, like we feed them, we hydrate them, we like give them lotion after they've taken a bath, we give them baths, like there's all sorts of things that you do to kids. Like we don't always remember to hydrate, you don't feed yourself three times a day. Sometimes you don't put lotion on after you take a bath, like you don't, there's all sorts of things that you do to be kind to children that if you did to yourself, you'd think like, wow, did lots of self care today, that'd be great. Um, This is also where you see cancer specific domains of support being really helpful so that like using the treatment center as a form of support rather than like family gatherings or gathering with friends, having like meal trains that, you know, might have helped the first time around, but this time using like a, a cancer hospital social worker rather than a social worker in the community might be helpful. I also have like rest without guilt in here as something that can be really helpful. Just a reminder if you're resting and feeling really like worried about what you should be doing instead, that's not always like the most restful thing you could be doing. So I do put that in there as a reminder, Um, which gets us sometimes into metastatic cancer. It's not to say that all recurrence is a metastatic cancer. Certainly there are plenty of recurrences that are not metastatic cancer. That's not why that's paired here. Um, But if your cancer is metastatic, which I know there are several folks that that might be the case, some of the stressors there are going to be fatigue, trouble sleeping, physical side effects of treatment that may be a little bit more um, ongoing, more long-term treatment, feelings of lack of control, financial toxicity because that treatment lasts ongoing, and difficulty affording home care. This is more specifically towards Um, people whose treatment might be in the United States. Not a lot of these studies are outside of the U.S. Some of the research that I, that's like cited here is in the U.K., um, but primarily it's the U.S. and U.K. and the studies here. Um, And then also because the psychological effects of treatment do increase in terms of long-term effects or long-term treatment. So people do fairly well being told, you know, you have to do this treatment for six months, for eight months, for a year. Like we, people in general, like time frames, like to know, like, okay, I can do anything for like a year. Like that's a, that's a time being told there's like, it's indefinite. This is going to happen. The rest of your life is a hard thing to understand as a person. People like time, it's what makes us make sense. And so a lot of that stress or a lot of that worry, a lot of that feeling of like symptoms of depression or symptoms of like, what does this mean? Questioning of self, questioning of identity is really common for people who are diagnosed with metastatic cancer who then have a lot of concerns about, you know, how to talk about this with other people. So I say this because I know that the next bullet then says like coping strategies is open conversation with care team, family, and friends. And I know that that's not an easy transition to make. And I say that because I do think it's helpful and what, how we get there, how do we have that open conversation with a care team, family, or friends depends on you, depends on your family, depends on your friends and your care team. But it can be really helpful to have the people in your life who are, and we haven't talked a lot about that yet in this hour, which is like hugely important what your family and friends support looks like depending on your mental health, but so that they know what's important to you because you are still you. We talked about changing identity, this brand new version of you, all these different parts of you, but the things that are important to you absolutely still matter. And a metastatic cancer diagnosis doesn't mean that the things you're passionate about disappear. It doesn't mean that the things you care about disappear. And so it's important for the people in your life to know that and to remember that because in the same way that we talked about what the cancer narrative looks like in your culture and your community, it's important for your friends and family to know that like this is a huge thing for you to process and for them to process, but that you are going to need some type of support from them or you are going to need for them to do X, Y, and Z that's important to you. And they might not know that. They might not know what that is. Even if in the back of your head, like right now you're hearing me say that and you're like, but it seems really obvious, Charlotte. I want them to know. I agree. I want them to know too. That being said, you might have to tell them, right? Because they might not know realistically. So whether that looks like writing a list of your coping strategies, writing a list of the things that matter to you, 
that you really care about and sharing that with someone, that might be a way for you to have an open conversation. That might be a way to like spark a conversation about like, what is it that you want to talk about? What is important to you? Um, this, we already talked about reframing language away from winning or losing either or. This can be helpful too, especially with metastatic cancer. There are certainly some times when metastatic cancer is something that, you know, there's like clinical trials, there's conversations to be had with your medical team. But I think especially, you know, this conversation around like beating it, what's the prognosis might be helpful, especially here to say like, are you showing up? Are you feeling comfortable? Are you having good conversations with people? It might be a little bit easier on yourself as a, like a measure. Um, and I do think peer support here can be really helpful just to see like what the conversation looks like for your type of metastatic cancer. Are there clinical trials? Are there conversations of like side effects that and different ways to treat side effects that might lessen your mental health around the stress of those side effects? Um, there is another slide just on like additional coping mechanisms, but I know we're like 13-ish minutes to time. So I want to check in. Do we have questions? Do we want me to run through these coping mechanisms? Um, yeah, I think we can run through them. Um, okay. I know in what you were discussing, though, one thing that really hit was taking care of yourself the way you would a child. Because I know a lot of the times this, you know, we hear like, oh, self-care, you have to take care of yourself. And like, people will say like self-care, like I'm going to take a day off from work or I'm going to get my nails done or I'm going to buy a new purse or like that self-care has to be like this big, extravagant, wonderful thing. But like you said, it doesn't. It's those little things like nurturing yourself and just taking care of yourself in those ways that you would almost, you know, a child. Um, I thought that was really great. Yeah. So and I, I put some of that's part of why I have this list in here too, because like, I think it can be great to take a day off. Like, days off of work can be really lovely and they can be really restorative. That's also absolutely like a luxury. If you can have a day off of work, if that's paid, if you have that affordability, if you have a job that allows that, like it also assumes a level of health that allows you to take a day off to do something that you care about. If you're experiencing a lot of side effects or if you're in treatment and you're not able to take time to do something that would otherwise give you respite, your levels of self-care and your access to your self-care activities might really be shifted, right? If your usual self-care activity is going for a walk, and I use that because that's like everyone's self-care mantra during COVID, right? It's been like, have you gone for a walk today? You know, if someone is in treatment and if someone is not feeling up to taking a walk or is really nauseous or has been like not otherwise able to have access to mobility because of their surgery or because of radiation or because of metastases to the bone, telling them to take a walk is not going to be helpful and is not really going to be like restorative to them. So what's something that is going to be a little bit grounding, a little bit accessible and that, you know, some of these on here are going to be more accessible than others. Some are going to resonate with some of you here in the group. And if there's anything on here that you're like, this is ridiculous, I would never do that. That's fine. These coping mechanisms are for you to pick and choose from. They're for you to like make sense of and to resonate with. And they don't, you don't have to do all of them. You don't have to do any of them. I put this list here. It's not comprehensive by any means, but I will kind of run through it generally with folks. If there are questions about it, you can certainly, you know, ask in the chat. You can also Google most of these. Um, there are like YouTube videos. There are, you can chat with your medical team about some of them. A lot of treatment centers have versions of these online, even if it's not, like your treatment center specifically, there are a lot of treatment centers that have like very public YouTube channels with like their medical professionals that have these. So I'll start with breathing exercises. There's box breathing, um, which is like breathing in for four seconds, holding, and you like imagine a box and holding it and going around. There's four, seven, eight, where you breathe in for four seconds, hold for seven, breathe out for eight. If you're not like if you're in treatment or if you have lung cancer or if for some reason that like pattern or that interval um, is not feeling like supportive for you, you can break that down and into like two, three and a half and four and like shift that, that's fine. Lion's breath looks silly to do on a Zoom that's recorded, but you stick your tongue out, you like 
look up at the ceiling and breathe in through your nose and out really loudly through your mouth. If one thing to pay attention to when you're doing coping mechanisms like this or to do breathing exercises is to see kind of how you're feeling. Are you feeling like you want to be grounded, like you want to settle those nerves? Are you feeling really low, like you want to be energized and want to like rise up? So it's sometimes helpful to see like where you're at. Lion's breath might be like a little bit more energizing. Um, journaling can be really helpful if you want to do a gratitude journal of things that you're feeling grateful for, a friendship journal, different people that have been supportive throughout the journey, different people that you're feeling like really grateful for. You can do three sentences about your day just to keep track of where you're at. Massage therapy, if you have the ability to pay for someone professionally, or if you have like a lotion that has a favorite scent that you're able to kind of pair with aromatherapy and you're able to give like your hands a massage just very briefly while you're sitting there. If you can massage like the tops of your legs when you're feeling nervous at a doctor's office, when you're waiting, that can be a source to do like some stress relieving exercises, even in public. Um, you can do professional acupuncture. There's different acupoint massages that you can like look up different um, treatment centers will have different like peer reviewed studies that have professional ways to do that for yourself. There's different grounding exercises as well. Chair yoga is fairly accessible for folks to do while in treatment if you're able to sit up. If not, there's also like exercises that you can do while lying down, different poses that you can do. Even the body scan that we did sitting can be done lying down. There are free yoga programs locally online. Like I said, different treatment centers um, might offer them as well or nonprofits. Progressive muscle relaxation might be a little harder to do if you're having neuropathy in the hands or feet, if it's like squeezing, you, it's a virtual background, you can't always see me. Um, if you're having any trouble like squeezing your hands, that might be a little bit more difficult, but if that feels like something you can do, you can definitely look into that. I put bibliotherapy in here. Sometimes that's helpful to pair with like talk therapy, but reading books about the cancer experience might be something that can feel really supportive. It also might really flood you with someone else's words that like you do not resonate with. So don't feel any pressure about doing that if that's not something that's going to be supportive for you. Um, there's a lot of, a lot others. That was like a very brief list. Um, but if there's any questions, that's, all the slides that I have here, I'd love to hear from some more folks there if there's questions in the chat. Yeah, this was, um, that was great. Um, so many great things you can do. And, you know, if one thing doesn't do it for you, here's a whole list of other ones to keep trying. Or um, I know me like trying like the the silly ones where your face looks silly or different yoga that I would be like, I'm not doing that. I'm like, sometimes you just got to give it a try. Um, so it's I think very silly and very fun. <laughs> yes. And again, giving yourself permission to do those things. Um, yeah. I'm just going through the comments here in the chat and everybody really just resonating with a lot of the content. Um, through the different sections we went through. Um, if Does anybody have any additional questions? If you do, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, we could probably take like one or two more questions. Um, so feel free to put those there. Um, I think you have one more slide or two more on. I have contact information here for folks who are in, um, the the US I mean you can you can call this the hope line if you're outside of the states but it would be quite costly so I would refer you then to like our website to look for resources um, and to email the our email there if you're for people who are joining here from outside of the US the hope line at cancer care is staffed by oncology social workers for people who are in the US. So our number is there if anyone wants to, to jot it down. It's open. I could really dive into the details of it, but it's open 10 to six East Coast time, Monday through Thursday on Friday, it's open 10 to five. Um, it is staffed by social workers. Like I said, we do case management, we have online support groups, we do have a lot of educational resources, different programming. 
our email, the info at cancercare.org is open. So if anyone wants to email that to ask for additional resources, we'll do our best to, you know, to connect you to other organizations as well. I don't know what the process to connect with Grit Health is to ask for other places. So I'll steer that back towards Lauren. But um, if there's questions specifically about things that I've mentioned that you, you know, are looking for and you email the info at Cancer Care, just mention that you, you know, saw Charlotte at Grit Health and you had a specific question and I'll get back to you there. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so like I had mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, what we do at Grit Health now, after we end in a couple of minutes, um, we will make tonight's uh, program available on our website. We recorded it because I knew Charlotte was going to tell us a lot of great things and some people couldn't make it here live. So we will have the recording as well as a blog that kind of summarizes things. Um, we will have that back on our website and I will actually email everyone probably in a week, week and a half uh, with that actual um recording on our website as well as the blog and Charlotte and I will touch base um, to make sure, you know, in my follow-up email and our blog that we have all the great information and some other things you guys talked about in the chat. Um, so be on the lookout for that. It is, it will arrive to your inbox and um, Charlotte, thank you so much. Um, I do see one question that uh, came up from Andrea in the chat if any of Cancer Care's resources are in Spanish or other languages. Yeah, so there's a, a fair amount of our fact sheets in Spanish. We have our case management is in Spanish as well. Some of our podcasts, our most recent podcast is in Spanish too. Um, our online groups right now are only in English, but there is a, a move moving forward. But we do have Spanish speaking social workers on our, on our hope line. The process, if they're on a call, is a little bit delayed. So if they call, if someone who speaks only Spanish calls our hope line, they might get transferred to a voicemail and then a Spanish speaking social worker will call back. So there, we do have Spanish speaking social workers who can direct them also towards like what our resources are and what others are as well. Okay, yeah, great. And then um, everything Cancer Care offers, you know, for patients, survivors, everything you guys offer service wise um, is free, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah. So great to know. Um, like I said, I'm going to put this information, you know, the websites and the email address and phone number in that follow up email and our blog and everything like that. So I will get the information out to you guys because you can't click on the PowerPoint. Um, I love that part, you know, it's fun, but uh, <laughs> Charlotte, thank you so much for being here. Um, great information um, and really resonated with me and I know a lot of others in the chat and like uh, Jacqueline just said, let's keep advocating for ourselves so we can get what we need to get and stay well. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Let us know if there's anything that we can do to members who are there who showed up today. I really appreciate that you guys came and I hope that, you know, if there's any other questions that we didn't answer, absolutely reach out. And I'm really glad that you guys are all here today. Thanks for the opportunity and Lauren too. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. And thank you again to Cancer Care and all you guys offer to the community. Um, thanks to the Grit Health team. And thank you um, ultimately to all of you that joined tonight um, and hung out in the chat and chimed in and uh, chose to be here and be here for yourself. So thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Bye.